Welcome to this episode of the Customer Centric Retailing Podcast, a forum for retail leaders to discuss industry trends, challenges, and opportunities. This is Anil. And this is Fabi. And each episode, we invite some of the brightest minds in the industry to discuss the future of customer centricity, with topics ranging from the rise of e commerce to brick and mortar operations to omnichannel technology to retail culture and how all of these elements come together to create customer centric retailing. Today, we have with us Oliver Banks, founder and director of OP and Co., and host of the Retail Transformation Show. Oliver works with retailers, medium and large, to guide their transformation projects to success, all the way helping them realize the true purpose behind their brand. Welcome to the podcast, Oliver. Thank you so much. It's really fantastic to be here. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Of course, it's, it's great to have you. Uh, and we have so much to talk to you about today, specifically around retail transformation, since I know that that's a topic that you're passionate about and, and that we are too. Uh, But before we jump into all of that and then picking your brain, can you just give our audience kind of an intro to yourself, what brought you here, uh, kind of what you specialize in? Yeah, sure. So I I specialize in helping retailers to transform their operations and their operating models. There's obviously lots going on right now. And one of the big challenges is trying to focus and prioritize what is the right strategy to take and which are the best elements to include in that strategy. So I work with retailers, as I say, to help them with all of that going on, get some program management in place, get some proper intelligent decision making going on rather than just uh, working on working on some gut assumptions. You know, my background actually before the world of retail was in engineering. And I, I kind of grew up in that world where it's much more focused on problem solving, much more focused on sort of innovation and sort of logical thinking and modeling. And I did Lean Six Sigma, Black Belt there and so on. So actually when I moved into retail back in 2010, all of those skills kind of transferred very nicely across. I joined Tesco in their, initially in their supply chain function and then in their internal consulting function, which has been just a, a fantastic shift to make. I've loved every second of it. And now uh, again, since 2015 now I've, I've been working, I founded my own company, OB and Co, working as a, an independent consultant. And now I also host a, another podcast as well, which is, uh, yeah, it's just a brilliant, brilliant opportunity to, to engage in such an important industry. You have such an, uh, such an interesting background. I think it's, it's cool that you have an, uh, an engineering background because that's, that's exactly the type of mindset that's typically missing for a lot of retailers. Um, so I think, you know, we can dig into that. I know Emil uh, is an engineer too, so I'm sure he feels a connection there. Um, but I wanted to ask you, one of the uh, really common buzzwords that we hear right now in the retail industry that I think you can shed some light on um, is digital transformation. And it's it's become one of those words uh, that retailers say a lot, uh, like omnichannel. Uh, and sometimes you get the feeling that they don't really know what it means when they're saying it. Uh, so how would you define digital transformation? What does it come down to in your mind? Well, I have to be honest, I do have a, a slight allergic reaction to the term digital transformation. You're absolutely spot on. It is used a huge amount right at the moment and not always right in the best intentions. I think for me, the term digital transformation misleads us because of that word digital. Everything is digital nowadays. It's just that we live in a digitally enabled world. I can't really imagine a major change that didn't include some form of system or some form of technology or some form of integration for sure. And and that word digital, it focuses our mind onto that bit. And quite often when we're talking about transformation, it's then easy to miss out the wider business questions around the actual proposition or the business model or the processes or the people involved in that and obviously the customer as well. So I think digital transformation misleads us. I do obviously strongly believe in in transformation though, which may have a digital element to it. But, you know, ultimately we live in a fast changing world. Everything's going on. And what we've seen over the past 10 years or so now is that the world continues and retailers and any other business actually for that matter, can either change with it 
or can do nothing and wait behind and then hope that they can rapidly pull out an urgent transformation that gets them back in line. But for me, the best strategy is to continue to evolve, continue to transform all of the time and keep pace with the market. <laughs> wow, Oliver, you know, that's fantastic. In fact, you know, you come from engineering background, I come from the same, and there's something I really catch here. In engineering, we always uh, are talking that, hey, we have to keep evolving, we have to keep learning, we have to continue to uh, learn new things and adopt them into our practices. Looks like, you know, in retail and in other businesses, we haven't thought about this type of, you know, situation where you have to keep learning and transforming. And this transformation that you're talking about is actually bringing the lessons of engineering and bringing it to these, you know, more of a retail business and all these business processes. Uh, and I can clearly see that, you know, all the, from manufacturing to, you know, supply chain management and everything, the processes were defined maybe like, you know, in early 20th century. And people have continued mm. to do, stick to the same processes. Only thing is they were using paper and now they are entering data into the computer. Uh, but really yes. what you are talking about is, hey, let's transform. The world has changed. The way we communicate has changed. Way, the way we move has changed. So really rethink from ground up. That's, that's amazing actually, you know, and I think um, it, it's a really a big challenge because even a small change is so hard to come when you've been doing certain thing for many, many years. So exactly. uh, there are definitely lots of complexities when it comes to transformation. It's, it's a big project, really, really big project. So really managing such assignments, uh, such, such projects is really complex, overwhelming. Uh, so yeah, it'd be cool to learn from your experiences that how, how retailers and businesses can actually get over with it can how can they you know manage this whole overwhelming situation or, or otherwise you know all these bankruptcies are <laughs> the final end of it looks like yeah and I, let, let's be honest i totally hate it seeing every individual company hitting the wall it's it just makes me want to cry to be honest um but retail is a people-powered business let's be honest you know, particularly if you look at, at shops, physical retail, the number of employees for some of these big companies is just astronomical. It's such a huge workforce. And we all know that people are resistant to change. So when you have a very large group of people who are naturally resistant to change, and then you have a very rigid operating model with sort of set processes and procedures that happen throughout the day. So there is that very strict, this is how we do it here. And then you say, let's shift that there is naturally going to be a lot of resistance. So when you're thinking about transformation, change management is a huge element in there. And that is something that, again, you need to be continuing to foster and it forms part of the culture eventually when you do get to that place where you are continually evolving. It's something that starts right at the top and flows all the way through the organization. And if you don't have that, you are gonna be in for a little bit of a bumpy ride, I have to be honest, whatever the transformation, frankly. Wow. So, so really, you know, you're saying it has to start from the top and in, 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 in certain sense, like, you know, uh, it's like we have to start communicating or thought process has to start at the CEO level and then come from uh, down from there. What if the CEO himself or herself is coming from a very traditional, you know, long history of doing things in a certain way? How do we help those CEOs and those people to be thinking about transformation, agility and, uh, and, uh, and this change management? Like, the whole idea of you have to change how do you how do you talk to them about it it must be challenging yeah so ultimately to transform i'm a strong believer that actually that has to start from within right how many times have we seen people start the new year and say i'm going to go to the gym every day i really feel that but they don't really commit to that and then by mid-january <laughs> they're out right or diets or whatever it's just the same in retail, right? If we don't truly commit to something, if we don't have a strong will to make it happen, it's really, it's just a set of empty words. And again, if you look at some of the uh, sort of very last trading reports from some companies that have unfortunately wound up now, you know, 
the words are very bright, very optimistic. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about this. We're talking about that. Looking back, you know, and th these are these are companies that now that have been gone for a long time. Looking at those words, you wouldn't believe that's the company that it was, right? And I think if you have hollow words right at the top, that's a major, major issue. Um, I, I, I sort of have this transformation trifecta of which the first part is having this strong will to change. And that does have to start at the top because otherwise you're going to get this natural resistance that occurs through the organisation. So how do you do that? Well, first and foremost, it kind of starts with, with, with the performance. There's got to be a niggle somewhere. Otherwise, you know, what, why would you change? It's a bit like... The, 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 the sort of the gym or the diet analogy I had earlier. If you're not feeling slightly self-conscious, you'd never even enter that discussion, right? Um, so what is that niggle? And how do you then explain that to everyone? How do you show people? How do you get people to really live it? I'm a big fan of going to see, you know, again, in physical retail, going to see what it's like, going to experience it as a customer, as a colleague, not on a sort of a, a red carpet visit, shall we say, but really understanding what it is like on a on a on just a normal day. How does it feel? How does it work? And then you can begin to see. And if, if the CEO, frankly, isn't getting it at that stage, uh, if, you're, if you're under the CEO, there's not a huge amount you can do unless you're uh, up for <laughs> starting a bit of a, a coup. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's... It, that's that's I guess probably above your pay grade if if uh, if you know someone high up in the organisation doesn't get it. Wow! Wow! This is amazing. So from what I get is a very actionable item is that if uh, the CEO really is motivated to move uh, for transformation, the one thing they can do is go themselves, experience the retail business in their own retail stores and all that, and then go visit much more modern digital first kind of companies like you know in america we talk about lululemon or uh, many other you know uh, companies including even like you know the companies that have transformed successfully like uh, best buy and, and target and all these companies and they can go and experience the sh uh, the exp uh, shopping experience in these places and i think that's where they can see clearly the difference and hopefully at that point they they get the idea that what is it that needs to change and why because I'm yeah. sure after you, uh, the, after experiencing ourselves, we know exactly what it means. And maybe that's where you're saying that that inner voice will come in. Hey, I really need to do something, right? Yeah, absolutely. And honesty plays a huge part in this, right? Um, and if you are not willing to take an honest look in the mirror, then there are bigger challenges afoot, quite frankly. You have to be able to critically assess your own business, but also look at the the positives of other businesses as well you can't just walk around a competitor and say ah oh, look at that that's not very good and ah oh, we're better at that that's not really particularly helpful to be honest and i have absolutely seen seen uh, people do that unfortunately <laughs> So, but then, you know, now definitely we are seeing, you know, I, I'm kind of like somehow I, I see that uh, that negative part that, you know, we very easily see those negatives in others and notice that. But then the other part of transformation is we have to really know about our own strengths so that we can, you know, say, well, these are my strengths that I'm going to keep and then work from there. So in the retail business, particularly for the companies that haven't transformed much in in long time, what do you think is the, what are their, you know, idea, can you give us ideas on how they would identify their strengths and then go from there? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to reframe that discussion if that's uh -huh. okay with you. And it's not so much thinking about the strengths, but thinking about the purpose. Why does that, or does your retail business exist? What's the point of it? You know, and by the way, the point is not just to make lots of money, right? It's got to be a customer focused point. How are you helping your specific target customer to achieve a goal, to meet an aspiration, to avoid a real pain point in their lives? Because if you can understand that, then you can design the business that is able to meet that. And maybe your, your strengths are naturally uh, aligned with that, hopefully. If not, then you have a hard choice to make. You say, actually, are we focused on the wrong business? Are we, should we 
massively transform and shift and evolve who we are, our target market, the way we approach things? Or actually, do we need to transform the, the, the internal business and build up new strengths, new capabilities? So I would start with understanding your purpose. It's really about why you exist and why are you relevant for, for customers, frankly? Yeah, yeah, I can totally relate that, you know, uh, this is like important that we know why we exist and how, why are we relevant for our customers? Because otherwise today we see that all these digital, digital channel and marketplaces and all these ways of selling the product, geography is no limit. Customers have unlimited options. So if exactly. you are trying to compete in a very generic transactional way that, hey, find my product, buy this product, pay for it, pay for it and get the item delivered. Like, you know, like getting it delivered next day is no differentiator. So what exactly that is actually, otherwise it is a just race to the bottom. What you are trying to do is you are trying to get the best price and the fastest delivery. Because this is like a really simple thing, doesn't represent your brand, right? So actually, customers are confused. They, they, they don't know uh, what you, why you exist. And in that case, all they are looking for is the cheapest price, basically, right? And, yeah. and that doesn't keep the business floating and doesn't bring any value to the customers. So actually, the, our brands have to really think what value they deliver to the customer. Mm. And in that case, actually, if customers really see the value, it will come from why your brand exists. If your brand is delivering certain experience or appealing to certain people who have a certain mindset, then they will come and buy from you. And at that point, you are not competing on price or you know how fast can, I, can you deliver that. But instead, you're competing upon the value that your customer cares for and which is super important and that's when you clearly you know you're out of that race of you know price competition and all that exactly and let's and not beat around the bush price is a strategy that can work the problem is only very very few companies a are set up to do that but b can win at price right there really is only one lowest price everyone else has to compete on something else right if you think about um you know, a, a branded product, whether it's a, a Lego set, let's say, that same Lego set can be available from many, many different retailers, both physical and obviously digital retailers as well. And you know that exact box is the same wherever you buy it from. It's the, the, the exact same contents. Maybe it's a different price, at which point, okay, what's the proposition there and what's the delivery and so on. But what else is there? How else can you stand apart? If you are selling that exact same product to someone else, why should someone choose you? That's a huge question to ask yourself. Why should someone choose you? Yeah, actually, you know, and we know uh, from our experience that human are still going to shop at the store because we like the the physical nature. We are by, uh, by uh, you know, human by, in their own instinct are actually very human. They uh, are very physical. They, they want to meet, they want to touch, feel, experience, and that's how they feel confident about it. In fact, you know, uh, yesterday I was thinking about it that re even though e-commerce is growing so fast, one, it is growing because of the price, but number two, we, the other thing that we are seeing is that there is a, almost half of the items that people buy, they return. And that is, you know, something uh, very critical uh, that hit me is that it is because the customers, they like to f touch, feel, experience the product before they actually commit to it. And in e-commerce, that's pretty much not possible. And so the, the good old retailing, I think the whole essence of good old retailing has to stay. We cannot simply, you know, replace all these things with a digital in the name of digital transformation, you cannot just simply put a magic mirror and replace it with the experience of trying on something. I mean, like, it's not possible, right? You can see it, how that color looks on it, but that, I don't think that is important. So, so I think the uh, good old retailers have to understand uh, the, the processes of retailing. The, the essence is that customer wants to come in the store, wants to experience the product. And now how can we use technology? to facilitate that, make it frictionless. How can we make it easy for customers to do it, experience the product and get the item? 
And when they experience, it's the opportunity for the brand to really deliver that exceptional, differentiated experience, uh, which their customer wants, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, obviously it depends on your specific target category uh, and, and niche, that sort of returns problem, but it ultimately does exist. And what stores are great at, let's be honest, is something they have to focus on, which is discovery. It's the ability to browse, the ability to be inspired. I think online retailers often struggle. I think there is a huge opportunity with content and with things like uh, augmented reality and maybe even virtual reality to begin to paint that picture and help customers choose. But nothing quite, as you say, nothing quite beats the ability to, you know, whether it's pick up a garment, feel how it, feel how it feels, see how it shimmers in the light try it on maybe <laughs> slightly difficult in the uh, in the current pandemic obviously but that will that will shift back in time i'm sure yeah and when we're talking about the uh, technology piece in particular is there anything that comes to mind as a must have for retailers that are looking to transform i know a lot of retailers are struggling right now because they are uh, relying on this legacy tech that doesn't allow them to create any of these experiences that we've been talking about um, is there any particular technology that when you're working or speaking with retailers comes to mind as kind of a must have? Not really, to be perfectly honest. It really does depend on the, the retailer themselves, their current tech stack, and ultimately, what are they trying to do? And each, each and every transformation is therefore a, a unique setup. So I wouldn't say there's any almost, you know, ideal tech stack that every retailer must go after. Because, you know, as to, to the discussion we've just been having, you want to be able to differentiate yourself, right? So think about how are you going to serve your purpose? And thus, what are the different elements of the proposition or of your operation or your operating model? Do you need to have some additional technology to support? Um, legacy is obviously a, a big challenge for, for many retailers, particularly the physical retailers. So, right. uh, you know, it's it's a question of really critically assessing which technologies would help. Where's going to be the best bang for buck? Where's going to be the best return? And I don't just necessarily mean financial return, right? Because there could be customer experience returns, which then do eventually transform into into a financial return. But it is slightly more difficult to 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 go down that journey, to be honest. Um, it's also worth thinking about how the overall ecosystem fits together. And again, that's that's about creating a coherent and engaging proposition. Yes, you could add in lots of bells and whistles. You could add in, you know, VR this and AI that, etc. But if it doesn't hang together, so, uh, customers see straight through that. So, Oliver, you know, it's like, uh, again, I'm going to back a little bit on the history. It's like, you know, we, uh, the transportation systems really evolved fast in, in the 20th century. Uh, and that actually made possible how we do retailing, like, you know, all these malls in the suburbs. And, you know, back in the day before that, it's like you could only walk to the or, or go right to the, you know, your horse to a retailer nearby and only so much you can bring with it. Yeah. Uh, but now with the cars and all that, we can do a lot more. So I think uh, the whole internet is a new uh, way of transportation. Like, you know, we are in, in like a 30 years ago, we cannot be doing this, right? Uh, when you are in UK, I'm here, she, uh, Fabi is in London and, and still having a live conversation. I mean, we'll have to come to a coffee shop, <laughs> all have to travel for like a month, right? So what yeah. I'm trying to get to is that we have to see uh, that this whole digital, uh, the internet backbone as one of the another highways, it's, it's like a you know, transportation mechanism. And now seeing that as a one more added layer of transportation, how well we connect with our customers uh, on the physical, on the you know, roads, on, on the streets, and then also on the internet, on the digital channels, because customers are walking into the store, yes, but they are also opening their phone. They are going to flip, you know, uh, click on the app, open, or your website, and they are actually in your store. Only thing is they can only do so much. They may not be able to try on the product, but they actually can browse the product. They can figure out what, 
other details, the product information. They would know if the product is in inventory in the st uh, store or not, right? And that additional information is influencing their decision to should they come visit the store or not? Because like, you know, if I'm looking for a certain shirt, I'm not going to go into the store if I don't, I'm not sure if the shirt is in stock in that store or is there is a process to get that item in the store. So I, th I think it's, it's really interesting and you know, it comes down to that question we raised earlier. Why should a trust, uh, why should a customer choose you? Uh, that's, that's, that's a big question. There, there is a huge amount of, of content out there, but it kind of comes down to the fulfillment piece, as, as you've described, but also the communication piece. How do you have an engaging conversation with the brand or the people within the brand, right? To, to understand more about a particular product, to discover more, to understand actually, I've got this party coming up. I want to look really good. I want to give this impression. I've got a new job, whatever, whatever. How does that, play into the shopping trip. I think what we've seen actually, you know, over the past year, whilst the pandemic's been going on, is a realization from customers that they have a mission that they're going on when they go shopping. It, you know, social, the, the, the social activity of shopping absolutely has existed for a hugely long time and will continue to exist as well, by the way, I think, but in the in the short term customers have become much more focused they want to know i'm going to this shop for this reason and i want to do this particular activity is it about finding something is it about buying something is it about picking it up whatever whatever so i think actually customers have come a lot more focused and what's going to be quite interesting is how that behavior shifts and reverts back and thus how it all plays out into the into the store operation wow yeah, in fact, you know, uh, taking it further, yes, after the store operations, actually the size of the store and the purpose of the store, right? Because uh, the traditional departmental stores like, you know, Big Macy's and all those, right? Uh, they are what? They are point of sale, but they are also kind of like a warehouse. They, they stock all those items. They are really big stores. Uh, but today, actually, you know, because of our different ways of delivering products, customers actually, they, you can repurpose your stores and make it more of experience centers. So let's see how it evolves. Like, I mean, like, you know, these shopping centers, these malls, they, uh, and, the, uh, and the, the size of the stores uh, definitely should be changing to address to the needs of the customer. Like you said, the mission oriented now that am I going to the store for experiencing the product? So is the store prepared for it? Or is it just like you walk in, you take a look at the shirt and, uh, and there's not really meaningful conversation happening uh, because the design is not uh, making it possible. Mm. I think it's really interesting. So all of this is really pointing to a question of what's the role of the store, which is really for many, many retailers right now under close observation. Why, why do we have stores? What are they there for? You know, is it around a point of fulfillment? Is it around uh, the discovery element? Is it around being able to advise customers and give that sort of high service touch point? Is it around being able to take in returns? Is it around um, you know being able to repair or to customize or personalize product? Is it around resale? There's so many different sources of why the store could exist. And if you are not clear on your purpose, it's gonna be very difficult to understand what the role of the store is. And also that forms then a huge transformation through the entire business. If you realize that your store is now less of a, a point of fulfillment and point of sale, but it's more about, I don't know, discovery and, and product repair, let's say, or product customization, that's a very different store operating model. It's a very different business that you need to go into. So actually, Again, kind of bringing us back, if you said, I'm going to do a digital transformation, you may not come to that conclusion, which is why it's so important then to be to be broader in your thinking and really understand the purpose and then the role of the store and then ultimately how you're going to shift your operating model. Yeah, to your point, I don't think there's a right answer to that question of what the role of the store should be. I think there's a lot of no. retailers that are 
uh, using stores primarily as fulfill fulfillment centers or others that are creating kind of experience centers where it's just a showroom and you can't even buy anything. And every retailer kind of has to find the answer to that question, which I'm sure is frustrating for the retailers that are struggling right now and there's no playbook that they can follow because they really have to support <laughs> their own path. Um, and I think, you know, something that's uh, that I've been thinking about as you guys have been talking is the word transformation itself is overwhelming. It's, it's a good word, but it's an overwhelming word because it really connotes that there's this huge upheaval that has to happen for you to be successful in this industry. And I think, you know, especially now when budgets are tight and the retail industry is kind of in flux, I think a lot of retailers are scared to change and don't even know where to start. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why retailers have been so slow. It's been moving at this glacial pace and everyone's wondering why, because it's so obvious they need to change and they're not. And it might be because it seems like too big of a project to undergo. So I'm wondering um, if you have any insight there in terms of where retailers should start, you know, what is the timeline? What is the you know, investment? Is it a multi-million dollar investment that has to happen right now? Can they take it slow? Can they ease into it? What, what does a blueprint kind of look like? Yeah, well, you are absolutely right. Transformation can be overwhelming and there is no right answer as well. Like you say, how do we, how do we approach this? It's big. We don't know if we're going to be right or not. Let's, let's wait and see, gather some more insight, gather some more data. I think that you need to be thinking about transformation in a couple of different ways. So there's a fundamental transformation which is this big grand scale change, which perhaps is shifting the business model, perhaps is completely new operating model. And that needs to, to, to start really at, at board level, to be, to be perfectly frank, and have some committed strategy around it that is you know, very clear, very closely linked to the company's purpose. We understand where we're going and people begin to get aligned at that, at that high level and then actually can begin to branch down and perhaps look at doing a store of the future or, or some form of trial like that. The other type of transformation that you must be thinking about is incremental transformation. And these are the, the smaller elements that actually play into the bigger fundamental transformation and they also get the culture ready for change, which is again, something we, we spoke about earlier, because you are making smaller optimizations, smaller changes, smaller shifts. Each one is doable in its own right. Each one gets the company more committed to change. And hopefully each one is driving you into the right direction as well. And if they're not driving you in the right direction, then uh, time to raise some questions on that. So I think you're right. Transformation can be scary. But ultimately, you have to you have to take a look at yourself and say, it, you know, are we on a burning bridge here? Is there any other option? You know, you want to, of course, obs uh, you know, assess all of the different options and really find the best one to go after. But you have to make a move at some stage. Otherwise, we've seen what happens if you wait and wait and wait and too late. <laughs> Yeah, actually, you know, uh, it's really, I, I get what, you, uh, you know, uh, in my, what I, um, I understand out of what you're saying is that number one is we had to get our strategy right. So this is something that has to happen at the CEO level or the, at the board level is we need to transform and what exactly, why we uh, exist and all that, right? We get that part. And then it is the actually, um, it has to be iterative model if we bring it back from our engineering experience is that, hey, let's take an iterative model and make a small change and let's get back into our you know, processes and make it happen and start working with it and ex get some experience and then take a next one and then take a next one. So mm. I think um, I know you always talk about agility. And so if we go back to or taking our experience of managing engineering projects, we can take those, you know, iterative, agile, iterative models where, you know, uh, every three months or every quarter or every six months, we can make a small, another small change and then another small change. And I believe that could actually uh, help retailers transform with a minimum risk or at least managing the risk properly. Uh, only thing yes. is we still have to match the pace with uh, with the runway 
because not everybody has infinite runway, right? <laughs> like, like I think, what was it? Fast and Furious 6, where the run, runway was, was like an endless runway, uh, but not every <laughs> retailer has that kind of runway, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that kind of comes down to having that clear understanding, that honest understanding about the situation that you know, your individual company is in right now and the, 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 the state of the, the environment around the company as well. You have to blend, in my view, the fundamental and the incremental transformation. So you have both running at once. So therefore you can begin to make these smaller changes, but also be thinking about the bigger changes in the background. I wouldn't say bet the house. I don't think that's the right way. But equally, if you just do lots of little tweaks and iterations, that's not going to be enough either. You know, I first saw Agile in play probably about 2008 now, so quite a long time ago, and was absolutely blown away by the speed and the pace and how concepts like an MVP, a minimum viable product, can really help to focus the attention of the entire team, the, the development team, and really drive them drive them through. And yeah, some some brilliant things. Agile is absolutely something that you need to be finding out more about because you, you don't want to go for that classic waterfall. I'll design a five year plan in detail, leave it and, uh, you know, sign, sign off all the business cases and everything, leave it. And then by the time you get around to it, the world has once again changed and you're, you're, you're out of date already. As we're kind of wrapping up here, Oliver, I did want to ask you uh, and actually go back to something that you said a couple of minutes ago about uh, the store of the future. Um, if there's mm. any kind of trend that you're you're looking at right now or that's catching your eye, there's obviously so much going on in the retail industry, but is there anything that you're looking at that you're thinking, wow, this is really interesting. I bet this is gonna pay, play a bigger role in this industry in the future than it is now. So I, th I think there's, there's always a lot going on. I think uh, micro fulfillment centers in certain niches in particularly in grocery is, is very interesting. I, I'm not sure 100% how that's going to play out into into other categories as well. I could definitely see it working in a in a department store where actually you've got this very broad range and you could quickly assemble and dispatch products for customers. Obviously that raises the question of, does anyone really need to get that particular product in a, a very short uh, time scale? Um, obviously, Grocery has its own own unique challenges with code lives, etc. I think there's there's a lot of different elements that are going to be under review when shopping almost begins to resume, which I'm personally quite excited about seeing actually how sustainability elements come back onto the agenda in terms of thinking about um, sort of resale of items, thinking about repair of items thinking about recycling and sort of the reverse logistics of end of life products. I think that could be quite an interesting piece, particularly as we begin to get, you know, more sustainable and sustainability is increasingly up the corporate agenda, as well as the, the consumer agenda as well, of course. Well, uh, we'll keep your prediction on file. This is one of the, uh, the questions that I love to ask. <laughs> because, um, I think it's so hard to predict what's going to be next in the retail industry because it's so dependent on what consumers ultimately want and they tend to change their minds quite a lot as well. Um, but I think, you know, it's interesting to get to, to get your opinion on that. And I think uh, that, that's a good place to leave it off. But I did want to uh, give our audience an opportunity to learn more about what's going on with you and, and how they can keep up with you. So, I mean, the, be the best place is uh, to keep up with me is by catching my podcast, The Retail Transformation Show, um, or, or alternatively, uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm Oliver Banks. Quite easy to find. I've got a little green circle around my uh, around my face. If you can't find me, <laughs> yeah, I, we would definitely recommend to our uh, to our audience to check out The Retail Transformation Show. A um, lot of great guests and great conversation, and we really want to thank you for uh, being a guest on our podcast. Well, listen, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. It's been really kind of you to invite me on and a great conversation. Thank you. 
Thanks, Oliver. Yeah, really, I really enjoyed this conversation. And, you know, I was, uh, so yeah, uh, I'll see, I'll look forward to next opportunity when we can have some more. Definitely. Looking forward. That's it for this episode of the Customer Centric Retailing Podcast, featuring our special guest, Oliver Banks, Retail Transformation Specialist. Oliver is confident that real transformation needs to come from the top. And if your executive leadership isn't bought in, it's going to be hard to deliver the kind of customer experience that people are looking for. No transformation roadmap is the same, but they all start with defining your purpose as a brand and determining the best way to realize that purpose through people, process, and technology. Be sure to check out Oliver's podcast, The Retail Transformation Show, for more of his insights. If you like what you heard here, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please rate and review and recommend to a friend or fellow retail fanatic. This podcast is brought to you by Hot Wax Commerce.